God who is goodness unto us. He is a faithful and he is a good God. Could you uh, please stand with me as we go to God in prayer? Bow your heads with me. Lord, we come before your throne of grace, Lord. We come in humble reverence unto you. Lord, we ask, Lord, at this hour, Lord, that you would grant unto us, Lord, the spirit of wisdom and revelation, Lord, in the knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask, Lord, that you will open our ears, that you will open our eyes, and that you will open our hearts, Father, to receive, Lord, the message that you have for us today. Let us go out, Lord, a different person, Father. Let us leave this place, Lord, determined, Lord, to live for you. Let us leave this place, Lord, with a burning, unquenchable desire to live for your glory and your glory alone. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Our text today is found in Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, starting at verse 25. And when you have it, say amen. Rest on your feet as we read the words together. <clears throat> and there went great multitudes with him. And he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and consulted and counted the cost, whether he has sufficient to finish it? Lest happen, after he have laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulted whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassador and desired conditions of peace. So likewise, who, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he had, he cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost its savior, wherewith shall it be salted? It is neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. The backdrop of our text today, it finds Jesus amongst the scribes and the Pharisees and a host of various classes of people. Jesus was invited into the home of a Pharisee and he begins to teach about humility when he noticed how the people that were invited begin to clout chase by coveting honor which was not due to them by choosing out the best seats of the house. Then he turns his attention to the one who invited him and he begins to teach on almsgiving, almsgiving and benevolence. And there was one in their midst that said, Blessed is he that shall eat the bread of God. Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. 
Jesus responds with the articulation of the gospel in the parable of the great supper. He, he explains the way of salvation that it has been made for the Jews. But because of the Jews' blindness of heart and of their deceitfulness of self-righteousness, it cloaked their sin with excuses. So that they could so that they could not discern the great need to answer the call to attend the marriage of the lambs. To attend the marriage of the lamb. The rejection of Jesus by the Jews opened the gates of heaven to the Gentiles. This was God's eternal decree and carried out by his sovereignty. So in our text today, Jesus is standing before the crowd, teaching the true essence of discipleship to counteract the false teaching of the Pharisees. That's my subject of today, discipleship. If you want to title the message, it's Discipleship 101. A reproof to the half-hearted and an encouragement to the faithful. Yeah. So as we look at our text in Luke chapter 14, verse 25, and there went great multitudes with him. The people were amazed by the many miracles Jesus had performed. In Luke chapter 5, Jesus had performed the miracle of the miraculous catching of the fish by Peter, James, and John. He also healed a leper and a man sick with palsy. In Luke chapter 7, Jesus healed the centurion servant with just an utterance of his words. In Luke chapter 8, Jesus steals the storm at his command. He also cast out a legion of demons out of a man. He also heals a woman that had an issue of blood for 12 years. And he also raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus feeds 5,000 men with five loaves of bread and two fish. And he also heals a lunatic. In Luke chapter 13, Jesus heals a woman who had a spirit of infirmity and who was bent over for 18 years. And in Luke chapter 14, Jesus heals a man with droopsy, which is the swelling of the body with fluid. Every miracle Jesus performed attested to who he is, who he was and who he is. And, he, and his power over sin and the oppression of the devil. Luke declares in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, yeah, yeah. who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil why? For God was with him. Jesus was God incarnate, meaning God in the flesh. He was a sight to behold. He was the express image of God. He was the beauty of God's holiness. The people were in awe of him because he talked them with authority. He commanded nature and demons with power. And because of this, his fame spread throughout the region and people came from near and far. In our modern day, this digital age, the age of social media, where everybody and their mother is trying to garner a following to capitalize from, would have considered this moment in our text as a grandiose opportunity to build a bigger platform. You see, the motive is the more followers I have, the more popular I become. 
But Jesus did not leave his heavenly throne to take up a cross to win a popularity contest. He came for a particular purpose to atone for the sins of you and I. So instead of trying to seize the moment, he turns to the crowd and he spells out for them what it is and what it means to be his disciple. Jesus is omnipotent, meaning he's all-knowing. He knows what's in the heart of you and I. He understands everybody in the crowd did not love him or serve him as he commands. In Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9, the preacher declares in the latter part of that verse, there is no new thing under the sun. We have crowds of people, members of churches, people involved in various ministries who profess Jesus but do not possess Jesus in their hearts. Many confess Jesus as Savior, but not as Lord. If he is not both Savior and Lord, then you are deceived. The people followed Jesus because they were in awe of the many miracles he had performed. Jesus' miracles proved to the people he could be their Savior. He could deliver them from their troubles and pain. But Jesus wanted them, wanted them to know, you can't just have me as Savior. You must take me as Lord. Yes, so he turns to the crowd and begins to teach them how they can take him as Lord. Which leads us to our next head, the command of discipleship. And he states it in verse 20, in verses 27, I mean, excuse me, in verses 26 and 27. And he says, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brother, brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Many people come to Jesus for various reasons. Some come to him as Savior because they want to be delivered from their misery. Some come to him because they want to be, they want many blessings he alone he could provide. Others come because they want to be good moral people and follow his moral teachings. All these things are true of Jesus. He is a savior. He is benevolent. He is a man of impeccable character. But to only want Jesus for these things is to miss the mark. He wants you to make him Lord. He wants to sit on the throne. He wants to sit on the throne of, the, of your heart. He wants to sit on the seat of the throne of your heart. This is a personal decision and choice that we all have to make. And it can only be done by the grace of God. The heart's cry of the would-be disciple should be as the psalmist in Psalms 73. Yeah. Whom have I in heaven but thee? Yeah, yeah. And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. Mm -hmm. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart yes, and my portion forever. Yes, For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish, but thou hast destroyed all them that go a whoring from thee. But it's God, but it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord, God. 
that I may declare all thy works. Yes, yeah. How is this done? Jesus tells us in verse 26 of our text. He sums it up in these two verses of how to have him as our Lord. We must worship him alone and sacrifice our lives for him. In other words, we must live and die for him. Let's unpack what that means one by one. Living for him. Luke chapter 14, verse 26. We read that. In verse 26, Jesus places a, his command of discipleship in direct correlation to our relationships with the people we hold near and dear to us. The scripture teaches we shall honor and obey our parents. It also teaches that as husbands, we shall love our, love our wives like Christ loved the church. It also teaches us that our children are a blessing and a heritage from God. And it also teaches that we should have special love for the household of faith. We see from scripture that God values relationships. Why would Jesus command a would-be disciple to hate those with whom he places you in covenant relationships with. This verse seems to contradict what the scriptures teach about how we should value relationships. But let me assure you, God is not an author of confusion. God is a God of decency in order. The contradiction is not with God. The contradiction is with you and I. God commands man to have no other gods before him. He commands man to love him with all his heart, soul, mind, and body. But since the fall, man has not been able to do this. Nor has man the power within himself to do it. Yeah, yeah. Jeremiah says, your heart and my heart yeah. is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Mm -hmm. He said it goes a whoring after other gods. That's right. The apostle says that we have changed the truth of God into a lie so that we worship and serve the creature more than we do the creator who is blessed forevermore. This is Jesus' argument in verse 26 of our text. His argument is that we as creatures, we rather worship and serve ourselves more than the creator. Jesus is forewarning his would-be disciples that he that loveth father or mother more than me yeah. is not worthy of me. Yeah. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Yeah. He doesn't want you to literally hate him. He just doesn't want you or want your love to, for them to rival yeah. your love for him. Yeah. Jesus said in John chapter 4, the hour comes and it now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such to worship him. God is seeking for the true worshipers to worship him in spirit and in truth. When we look out on the horizon of the world, if you have eyes to see, you can see that the scriptures are being fulfilled right in front of our eyes. We are living in the last days. 
We are living in perilous times. Men are lovers of their own selves. They're covetous. They're boasters. They're proud. They're blasphemers. They're disobedient to their parents. They're unthankful. They're unholy. They're without natural affection. They're truth breakers. False accusers. Without self-control. Fierce. Despiser of those that are good. They are traitors. They are heady and high-minded. They are lovers of pleasures more than they are lovers of God. That's what you see when you look out on the world. But I know that that is not only what you see when you look out on the world. That is what you see when you look out in the pews of the church. Here's the thing. God will prove whether or not you worship him alone are idols of your choosing. Proverbs 17 and 3 says, the fining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord trieth the hearts. We looked at one side of the coin of discipleship, of the command to discipleship, in terms of living for Jesus, which demands that we worship him alone, and allow him the seat of the throne of our hearts. Now let's look at the other side of that coin, which is to die for him. And he says it in Luke 14, is 27. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Excuse me. Jesus taught his disciples, the disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple to be as his master and the servant as his Lord. The ultimate compliment you can give someone is to model your life after them. Jesus puts it in these words. He says, he that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loses his life shall find it. In our text, Jesus commands a would-be disciple to bear his cross. Jesus had to bear a cross. And he commands that every would-be disciple do the same. What does it mean to bear a cross? Does it mean to be long-suffering with tribulations and hardships of this life? Does it mean to bear up under the weight of persecution? I say yes and yes. But it also means that you have to mortify your flesh. Paul says in Romans chapter 6, that the state of mind of a would-be disciple should be this. Let no sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye shall obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield your members unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, yeah. for ye are not under the law, yeah. but under grace. It is the grace of God that gives you the power to mortify the flesh. If you, not, if you have not fulfilled the first commandment of discipleship, which is to worship God alone, in other words, to live for him alone, then you will have no grace to honor the second commandment of discipleship, 
which is to, to die for him. The first command of discipleship provides the would-be disciple with the inspiration and power to fulfill the second command of discipleship. To live for and die for Christ works like a revolving door. The more Christ takes residence in your heart, the less room sin dwells in your heart. In other words, the more you fall in love with Jesus, the less room for sin to dwell in your heart. The old hymnal says it best. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus and to take him at his word. Just to rest upon his promise and to know, thus saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. How I prove him over and over. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, to trust his cleansing blood. In a simple faith, to plunge me neath the healing, cleansing flood. Yes, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to see. Just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. The command of discipleship. It demands we live and die for Jesus. By devoting our lives to him and crucifying our fleshly desires. Now I want to draw our attention to the consideration before becoming a disciple, which is found in two parables in verses 28 through 32. Twenty-eight reads, For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and consulted Excuse me, and counted the cost whether he has sufficient to finish it. Least happily after he have laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. The command of discipleship is not something to be taken up on a whim but rather imposes serious, thoughtful consideration. Some decisions can be made rather quickly, but when it comes to life-altering decisions, you have to do what Jesus calls for in our text. You have to sit down, count the cost, and consult with wise counsel. We have to remember Jesus is standing before a crowd of would-be disciples who have been following him because they were amazed by his miracles. They sought him not for the purpose for which he came into the world, to atone for men's sins, but for their self-serving desires. So Jesus stops and turns to the crowd to put them on notice. Why? Not because he wants to deter them from following him, but because he wants to redirect their hearts to their need of him, not just as Savior, but as Lord. He gives them the command of discipleship in verses 26 and 27, and he gives them two parables to illustrate what is to come and how a would-be disciple should respond to what is to come. The first consideration of a would-be disciple is endurance. Now the logical question is, endure what? 
What is Jesus calling this would be disciple to endure? Why does Jesus want me to consider this? To what end, to what purpose? Paul teaches his son in the faith, Timothy, that all who desire to live godly in Christ shall suffer persecution. This is not a maybe. This is a must. Any would-be disciple that desires to live godly, Paul says, will suffer persecution. So the question is, can you endure? Can you endure persecution for the sake of Jesus? Or are you going to be like the hearer whose seed fell on stony ground? Here is how they responded to persecution. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that hears the word and immediately with joy receives it. Yet have he not root in himself, but endures for a while. For when tribulation or persecution comes because of the word, by and by he is offended. So, can you endure persecution? Or are you going to become offended for being persecuted? For the sake of the word. Jesus' desire is for every would-be disciple to be like the apostles. They rejoice to be counted worthy to suffer for his name. They gloried in their tribulations. They took pleasure in their persecutions. And they were strengthened by the Holy Ghost. This is what you must consider before you start. Why? Because the just must live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Can you endure persecution for Jesus' name's sake? This leads us to our second consideration of discipleship, which is spelled out for us through verses in verses 30 through 32. Oh, excuse me, 31 and 32. Are what king going to make war against another king? Sit it not down first and consult whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is a great way off, he, uh, he sends an ambassage and desire conditions of peace. Excuse me. A would-be disciple must not only consider if they can endure dangers of bearing the name of Christ, they must also consider if they can fight the good fight of faith in engaging the prince of the power of the air. Yeah, yeah. The scripture teaches that a would-be disciple must be sober and vigilant because the adversary, the devil, is as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He is a, an accuser of the brother. But Paul says this, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. For we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but, we, but against principality, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And know this, the weapons of our welfare 
They're not carnal. But they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Yeah. A would-be disciple must not recompense to man evil for evil. He must, with all with what lies within him, live peaceably with all men. See, the goal of war warfare for the would-be disciple against his opponent is not to annihilate him or seek vengeance upon him. Because vengeance does not belong to him. It belongs to God. Jesus states the goal like this. He says, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be children of your Father which is in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good. And he sent it rain on the just and on the unjust. So what he's saying, you, you are no better than your enemy. We are all sinners alike. If it wasn't for the grace of God, we would still be in the same position that many folks are, dead in sin. You can't pat yourself on the back because you don't have them. You didn't do it. But he says this, for if you love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? You're not doing nothing special when you love somebody that loves you. And he says, and if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans the same. Here's what he says. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is heaven is imperfect. How is that demonstrated? Yeah. Jesus came and died for us while we were yet his enemy. The would-be disciple must seek to make peace with their enemy. The first consideration of discipleship before embarking upon the journey is, can you endure persecution for Jesus' name's sake? And the second consideration of discipleship is, can you forgive those that persecute you? Which leads us to our next head, the cost of discipleship. Verse 33. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath cannot be my disciple. In verse 33, Jesus sums up what he has been teaching. To obey the command of discipleship is to live and die for Christ. And to consider is to endure persecution and forgiving your persecutors. You cannot be attached to this life. A would-be disciple must follow in the footsteps of the heroes of faith who did not love their lives unto death, but they surrendered all for the sake of Christ. Why? Why did they do this? And here's why they did it. Because the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Jesus is the pearl of great price 
to be treasured above all treasures in this life, in the life to come. So, we know the command, the consideration, and the cost of discipleship. Now let's look at the claim of discipleship. Verses 34 and 35. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost its savior, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land, nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that have ears to hear, let him hear. The command, consideration, and the cost of discipleship. Is to make the wood be discipled. A vessel unto honor. Sanctified and needed for the master's use and prepared for every good work. The claim of discipleship is to be useful, bear fruit in due season. He that have ears to hear must bear fruit. Some will bring a hundredfold, some will bring 60, and some will bring 30. But to bear fruit, the branch must be connected to the vine. For the wood be disciple to bear fruit, he has to be connected to the true vine. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husband. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. In closing, Jesus has provided us a model to fashion and pattern ourselves in. This model depicts what true repentance and faith in Jesus demands to be useful in the kingdom of God. In our own strength, we can never meet such high demand. For those who have come to Jesus with right motives of heart, let us continue Looking unto Jesus as the author and finisher of our faith. For God is faithful. And he will continue the good work in you that he begun. Until the day of Jesus Christ. And for the ones who have come to Jesus with the wrong motives of heart. Examine yourself in the light of God's word. Please stand with me as we close the day. Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord, with humble hearts. Lord, I pray, Father, that we were challenged, Lord, by this message today, Lord. Lord, I understand, Lord, that the times we live in, Lord, are difficult. Lord, you have given us a spirit of fear, Lord. I mean, you have not given us a spirit of fear, but you have given us a spirit of power and of a sound mind. Lord, we don't have to live in fear, Lord, of what is going around us in the world. Lord, we can endure, Lord, persecution for your name's sake. Lord, we can forgive those who persecute us, Lord. But we can only do this, Lord, through the grace and work of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, work mightily, Lord, in our hearts, Lord, by your Spirit, Lord. Lord, in those areas, Lord, where we are lacking, Lord, in our lives. Expose those areas, Lord. Bring them to the forefront of our minds, Lord, so that we may deal with them according to your word, so that we may mortify, the, mortify our flesh, Lord, through your word and by your spirit according to your grace. 
Lord, we need you even more, Lord, in this hour, Lord, for you are soon to come. The writing is on the wall, Lord. Let us be watchful. Let us be mindful, Lord, and let us cling even more to your throne of grace. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. Amen.